running a business uh, with her husband near Houston, Texas. Uh, it's a high precision, high precision oil field machine shop. Well, Catherine decided to volunteer as a poll worker for her local precinct. She had previously, like many of us, not been involved in you know, anything political or you know, getting into policy or anything like that, but she decided to volunteer as a poll worker. Well, what she saw uh, in her precinct in Houston shocked and amazed her. Catherine had the guts to help shine the bright light of integrity on a, a voter registration fraud case that was perpetrated by a member of ACORN um, in Harris County. So thanks to Catherine, the Harris County authorities got on this and found that uh, something like 23,000 voter registration forms turned in by the ACORN operation were invalid just in Harris County. Well, rather than just saying, oh, isn't this terrible? Why doesn't somebody do something about this? Catherine decided to do something about it. So that's how true the vote was born. So by Election Day 2010, just a couple of years later, True the Vote had 1,000 poll workers trained and ready to uh, help out at the polls in Harris County. Uh, 1,000 in just two years. That's not too bad. Fast forward to uh, 2012. True the Vote now has thousands of grassroots volunteers across the country. They are trained on helping to, uh, to prevent what have, in some cases, been coordinated attempts to subvert our electoral process. Uh, let me just read to you from um, a letter that Rick Perry, the governor of Texas, wrote to uh, Catherine. I'll just read a couple of excerpts from this letter he wrote back in April. I'm proud to know that citizens like you across our state and nation are working so hard to ensure that all of our votes are fair and free. With so much at stake, I hope that citizens across the nation, along with organizations like yours, like True the Vote, continue to work hard to make our voting process more fair and transparent and that other states enact legislation similar to what we have in Texas. Our founders, our military personnel, and our families work too hard to have unscrupulous and illegal practices jeopardize the integrity of the ballot box. Sincerely, Rick Perry, Governor of Texas. Let's give a warm steamboat welcome to the founder and president of True the Vote, Katherine Engelbrecht. Before we get going, I just want to, if, is it okay if I stand here? Is it all good? Okay. Thank you guys for having me this evening. I am thrilled to be here. Hey, beautiful. This is just, it's going to be hard for me not to just keep looking out the window. We do not get changes of leaves like that in Texas. As, uh, I'm traveling and I'll introduce her in a second, but Adriana Boyne, was, we are talking on the way over. In Texas, it's either green or dead. There is no <laughs> in between. Um, okay, so uh, Jennifer did a great job in, in sort of lining up why I'm here, but if you'll indulge me, what I'd like to do is, is really give you uh, some of the play-by-play -play that took me from the, the uh, conscientious objector in 2008 to where I am now, because I can assure you it is a journey that I never in my wildest imagination thought that I would ever find myself being a part of. Um, and then, once I tell you about what we do and, and how we do it and encourage you all to get involved, I'd like to turn it over to questions because there's been so much breaking news in the last few days on the subject of election integrity that um, I'm, I'm betting that we can have a pretty hearty discussion just on uh, what the different states are doing and why they're doing what they're doing and, and what it means to us all nationally, what it means to us here in Colorado. So, um, a quote that I've found myself... Uh, becoming more and more, uh, <laughs> becoming more and more quick to use. If men were angels, no government would be necessary. In, in, right, James Madison, Federalist 51, trying to make the case that we, we, when they were trying to explain what the Constitution was going to be about and what we're encouraging, when we all meet for convention, we really got to think about what we're doing here and how we're doing it and why we're doing it. Um, as you'll hear further into my story, there is this phenomenon happening right now in our country where we are, for whatever reason, um, not willing to talk about potential of vote fraud. Uh, we, are, we are not willing to talk about the importance of photo voter identification. And when I say we, I don't mean everyone. I suspect that in this room we're going to be able to have a, 
you know, a, a very detailed conversation about it and the importance of it. But as a general statement, we find that our current administration doesn't want to have those conversations. In fact, our Department of Justice is suing states that are trying to clean up their voter rolls uh, because they will be very quick to tell you there is no such thing as voter fraud. But if men were angels, no government would be necessary. And, um, you know, we, we would be hard pressed to look at any portion of our government and not see corruption. Why we would believe that our elections would be sacrosanct, why we would believe that the moment that we walk through those polling place doors, we all put on our halos, it just, it defies logic. I think we, we are at a place where we've got to look carefully, consider, thoughtfully what is at stake, why it is that this administration doesn't want to ask the questions that maybe need to be asked, and I'll speak to that as about in my own personal experience and what I've seen thus far. Okay, so what is True the Vote, first of all? True the Vote is an initiative developed by citizens for citizens to inspire and equip volunteers for involvement at every stage of the electoral process and to actively protect the rights of legitimate voters regardless of party affiliation. True the Vote has never been about party. It has been about principle. In 2008, I like, um, let me ask this quick show of hands here so I know who I'm talking to. Uh, how many of you were involved in politics before 2008? Just a quick show of hands. I'll probably ask it the wrong way. How many of you were not involved in politics prior to 2008, 2009? Okay, well then it's got, it's actually more of you had been involved. I'll, I wasn't one of you. I was one of the ones that just kind of watched from the sidelines as things were happening in our country that I didn't, I didn't really think were the right direction necessarily, but I, there was such a disconnect, a personal disconnect between me and government that I didn't know quite where I would ever, you know, find a fit, be able to make a contribution. But in 2009, um, nobody's going to be surprised at uh, hearing that there was a thing that happened called the Tea Party. And I was swept up into that because when, when I watch the presidential debates, and it's, it's stunning to me that we're going to see four years later, your, the first debates tomorrow night. When I watched the presidential debates in 2008, I found myself questioning, why are we talking about the things that we're talking about in these debates? It'll be interesting to see what the content will be tomorrow, tomorrow night. But in 2008, it seemed like we were much more focused on the zingers, on you know, who, had, who had the best smile, who had the, you know, who had the most swagger. Meanwhile, our country was, was heading off a financial cliff, and that didn't seem to be uh, part of the discussion. When Rick uh, Centelli, on the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange one morning, looked into the camera, and said, ladies and gentlemen, I think it's about time for a tea party. How many of you obsessively read the Drudge Report? Show of hands. Okay. I obsessively read the Drudge Report, and you know, they, they give, um, you know, some, sometimes hourly updates, and so I'm constantly clicking to see what the newest news was. Well, when that video clip came on, I was right, I mean, I was right there when I saw Rick Santelli put that out into the ether, and there was something in me that said, man, I think I could, I think I could be a part of this. I think I could... I think I could potentially find a way to be of use if this is really something that could happen, this whole Tea Party concept. And so, um, in the spirit of the Twitter message that is to follow, I hacked into my son's face account, Facebook account immediately <laughs> and um, tried to figure out what might be happening with the Tea Party because it, it, this was all still you know, evolving from nothing. But sure enough, there were already people on Facebook talking about having a Tea Party in Harris County. Now, I live outside of Harris County. Um, in a little suburb, but I felt like if anything was really ever to come of a tea party, it happened in Harris County, and I wanted to be in the thick of it, so there we were. And many of you, I suspect, in the room have participated in rallies, and, and I was no different. I, I went to the, the grocery store and bought the poster board and the, the glitter paint and made my sign that said, cut the pork, which I thought was brilliant at the time. <laughs> uh, but... <laughs> But in more than anything, it was, it was a way for me to find my voice, which, frankly, I didn't know that I had. I, I, I didn't know that there was that in me. But as the rallies rolled on, 
um, something else struck me, and that was that we're really not getting too much accomplished. Something had to change. We had to find a way to take that passion and translate it into action. And so there was a little group of us that continued to find ourselves sort of shoulder to shoulder at these rallies, holding our little signs, going, what? Have you ever done this before? No. Have you ever done this before? No. Well, what do you think we should do next? I don't know. What do you think we should do next? So we got together, and we tried to look at our options. This was now uh, October of 2009, an off year for elections, but it was a hotly contested election in Harris County. And so we were told that there was a need for people to go and work at the polls. And we thought, well, that's simple enough. We'll go, we'll work at the polls. It'll be a quick one-day thing. We'll check that off our good citizens list, and then we'll move on to something else. But it was what happened in 2009 that brings me here. Because for all the fluster that got me to that point, when we went and worked in the polls, we saw everything from gross confusion to the point that you wonder how how you can trust anything that's coming out of a polling place because there was such confusion about paperwork and audits and whether or not the numbers matched. Uh, but we also saw what can only be considered vote fraud. I mean, we saw people who would come in without any form of identification whatsoever and be allowed to vote. Uh, in Texas, you have to have identification. Now, that you can, there's one of 11 kinds of identification that you can use. You can use your water bill, you can use your blockbuster card, but you have to have something. These folks didn't have anything, and they were yet, they were passed right through. Uh, more disturbingly, we saw people who would come in with multiple registration cards. And when they present the first one, the clerk would say, oh, I'm sorry, that, sir, you've already, already shown to be um, having voted early election. Oh, okay, well, what about that card? Oh, that card's good. Go on and vote. Or, and this is probably the thing we saw the most, and still to this day we see the most, that really really set you back on your heels, is we saw people who would come in and just sort of sheepishly whisper, I don't remember who I'm supposed to vote for. And then the election judge would say, oh, I can help you with that. And to the voting booth they would go, and then you would hear the election judge say, this is how you're going to vote straight party. Or put your hand on my hand, and we're just going to, we, we vote with what we call East Lights in Texas, where you have this little turn dial thing like a rotary phone used to be. Put your hand on my hand, and we're going to click three to the right and four to the left, and we're just going to hit the green button, and you're all set. Now, please, please, please do not misunderstand me. There are very legitimate reasons that people may need assistance in voting. You may have a physical limitation. You may not understand the equipment. There may be a language barrier. That is not, that is absolutely okay. That is not what I'm referring to. What I'm referring to is people that, that for who knows how long, thought it would be fine to just get to the polling place and someone would deliver them from there. <clears throat> Whether or not they knew it, their vote was being stolen right out from underneath them. And so when we saw these things, as, as we came back together, now it's a very small group, as Jennifer pointed out in 2009, it was just like a dozen of us. I mean, we were just, just a very small group trying to figure it out. Most of us had had wonderful experiences. Quick show of hands, how many of you have ever volunteered to work in the polls as a judge or a poll watcher or whatever? Okay. Some of you in the room may be able to relate to some of the stories I've just relayed, but I suspect that most of you haven't. Haven't seen anything like what I'm describing, and that's a good thing. Uh, most of the folks in our little group in 2009 came back and said, oh my gosh, it was, that was a wonderful experience. It made me proud of our process. It made me proud to be an American. It reaffirmed how we can function as a constitutional republic. But there were some who came back and said, and you're not going to believe what I saw. And their stories were so similar. Now, the natural question is, what did you do? What did you do when you saw those things? What did we do? In 2009, we looked at each other when it was happening and said, hey, I, I, don't, I think that's illegal. I don't think that that should be, I don't think we should be doing that. We had no idea what to do when we were inside of the polls because if any of you have ever had anything close to the type of experiences that I'm describing, you know it happens in the blink of an eye. And if you don't know what the law is, if you don't know what the proper chain of command is, then it just, it happens. It happens and the vote is gone before you know it and, you know, you're on to the next registrant. Well, once we compared notes, we recognized that, you know, as, as they say in Houston, Houston, we had a problem. And we weren't quite sure what it meant, but we knew that we had to do something. We had really just a couple of options, right? We could, um, 
forget about it and pretend that it hadn't happened. We could have said, man, I hope somebody does something about it. Or we could say, you know what, I think there's a way for citizens to get involved, so let's take a look at it. I submit that much of the reason uh, that we find ourselves now in uh, some of the perilous places that we find ourselves as a country is because for far too long we've thought that someone else was going to take care of it. For far too long we've thought, well, you know what, government's probably got a plan for that, and, you know, I'm, I'm busy. I'm busy doing my thing and working and raising my family and volunteering and going to church. Hopefully somebody else has got that under control. Ladies and gentlemen, our elections are the cornerstone of everything that we are as a country. We do not need to look further than two, the year 2000 to our presidential election when we decided our president out of Florida, 537 votes. Fast forward into 2008 where we had a race for the Senate in Minnesota. Al Franken and Norm Coleman decided by just over 300 votes. Later to be revealed though that after ballots were found in people's trunks, um, over 1,100 felons had voted, more than the margin of victory. Um, in the last 18 months, there have been prosecutions for vote fraud in 31 states. This is a real issue, and we have to deal with it, because if we don't, it threatens to undermine every other decision, every other discussion that we could ever possibly have. So once our little group decided that we were going to do something, we were going to be true the vote, what does that really mean? We wanted to look at what citizens could really do. Uh, you know, let's deconstruct the whole thing, soup to nuts. How, how do names get added to the registry, first of all? Then let's look at the registry itself. You know, you hear there's, if there's dead people on the rolls, there's duplicate entries. Is that true? Is it not? If it's, if it's not true, great, then we'll all go back to our normal lives. But if it's true, what can citizens do about it? Then we looked at needing the help uh, of people in the polls. There are certainly nowhere near the number of polling place workers that are needed even across the country. And then collecting data all along the way so that once we got to our state legislative session, we'd be able to prove whether or not what we were seeing was uh, deserving of election code reform. What that became then was a three-part process that addressed some very specific things. Ah. And just to tie off on, on nationally what we face. I mentioned in the last 18 months there have been prosecutions in 31 states. In the last few years there have been prosecutions for vote fraud in 46 states. Uh, Pew Research came out with a report in February of 2012 that said one point, roughly 1 1.8 million dead voters are on our national rolls. Uh, one, the same research came out from Pew, one in eight registrations is inaccurate. That's about 13% of our registry. Ladies and gentlemen, can 13%, that's 13 points in today's pollster language, can 13 points swing an election? All day long. As, as our organization has grown and we've taken on different research projects, one of the research projects we've taken on is looking at those counties that have more than 100% of their eligible population registered to vote. Um, and I'll tell you, Colorado has some of those, but the good news for Colorado is Scott Gessler is on it. And you are, you, you are very, very fortunate, in my opinion, to have the Secretary of State that you have who is looking so closely at trying to, trying to do what they can do to make sure that your roles are accurate going into the November elections. And then uh, it's, you know, it's undeniable there is an all-out assault on voter ID, which is mystifying. So we do three things, as I mentioned. We provide training and working at the polls. We provide technology. We want our, our, our uh, volunteers to be able to look at their own roles and determine, are there problems? And if there are problems, what can you do about it? Well, there are, there are by way of federal law, provisions called citizen challenges, where you can challenge the registrations of another voter if you think that there's something off with them, and turn those over to the county and say, hey, can you take a look at this? It's just a, a way that you can actually have a, a hand in making a difference in your own community. And then the general support uh, of, of fixing what needs fixing. We, 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 you know, ladies and gentlemen, we've, we've, we've reached a point in the life of our country where we can no longer be happy that we've forwarded an email or that we've signed yet another, frankly, yet another bogus petition that generally is just an email aggregator to get your email so they can send you more stuff. It's the time, now's the time to, to roll up your sleeves. Now's the time to roll up your sleeves and figure out where you can plug in. So, 
how do we start as a general statement? I gave you a little bit of the background overall, but when we started looking at names as they got into the registry, um, we, we found ourselves looking, at doing a long, hard looks, frankly, at, um, oh, this is, that might be an advanced pack, back one here. We found ourselves looking at voter registrations. Now, why did we, why did we do this? Quick show of hands, how many of you have ever registered voters? Been involved in registration drives, okay. You know that is a, that's a labor of love. You spend many times all day long and you get maybe a couple, a couple dozen applications. Well, when we started doing this, now we're into the summer of 2010, um, a group had come to Houston by the name of Houston Votes, kind of just sprung up, and they made headlines saying that they were going to get over 100,000 new voters registered in the matter of a couple of months. That completely was at odds with any of the experiences that we had ever had trying to register voters where we thought, you know, we'd put up tables out in front of, you know, the gun conventions in, in Harris County like no one had ever thought to do that before. That would be the cleverest thing. And guess what? We didn't get a whole lot of, uh, a whole lot of, the, of registrations to show for it. But now this group was going to get 100,000 new people registered in a matter of a couple of months. And you have to question where, where are they finding these people? Have it, is there like a lost civilization <laughs> that we don't know about? And if so, that's great. Let's register them. That's great. But if not, maybe something's up. So what we did was we began filing open records requests, and we asked to see uh, a range of criteria of applications. Our, our uh, supposition was if these were actually being part of a, a larger sort of mill operation where they were just churning out applications, maybe that wasn't the case, but if it was, we thought that maybe there would be a tendency to make more mistakes. And if we could develop patterns in the mistakes that were being made, then maybe we could uh, show those to the county and they would be encouraged to take a bigger look. And that's exactly what we did. What did we look at? Okay, I don't know if you can see this. Hopefully you can. But these are the kinds of things we saw. We, we asked for applications where the top line name and the bottom line name didn't match. For example, this person started out at the top of the application being Tamakin Harrison. By the bottom of the application, they were Bruce Kelly. All right. <laughs> now, this is, this is an interesting one because, you know, handwriting samples are always tough, but it's, it's interesting for a number of reasons because this is just three of, I don't know, hundreds that we saw like this. This gentleman, you can see that uh, this uh, volunteer deputy registrar, Jonathan Hawkins, registered Adam Riley, a very, uh, you know, simple straightforward handwriting, and then Mr. Hawkins signs at the bottom. But Mr. Hawkins writes with a, a very curious little three in the middle of the J. And as we went through, we saw those threes and the Js over and over and over and over. Now, you may make the, the argument that, you know, a lot of people could put threes in their Js, and maybe so. We also have other examples that are not here. Um, you know, uh, the federal application asks, right up at the top here, are you a United States citizen? And we saw applications where they barely, very clearly checked, no, I am not a citizen. <laughs> and they were still registered to vote. And I'll tell you what, there's the travesty in that. A lot of these major industrial efforts that go out to register these masses of people, they're getting paid per registration. They, don't, they will register your dog if it doesn't run away. They will do anything they can to get these pieces turned in. And non-citizens get caught up in that because they believe that if someone's coming to them and asking them to register to vote, that whoever is asking that of them must, must know that that's okay, right? They wouldn't be asking me to do anything illegal. What they don't understand is that if, as a non-citizen, if they really do cast a vote, that threatens, that threatens to have them deported immediately. It's a very, very serious deal, and, and it's, it's not commonly known. Um, what happened? Well, after we went to the county and we said, we think you have a problem. In fact, we think you're in the middle of being enrolled. Uh, the county said, you know what, we're going to take a look at 24,000 applications just of this group Houston Votes, okay? Out of the 24,000 applications that they looked at, 7,000 and change resulted in new names being added to the registry. Brand new names, all good, added to the registry. The remaining 17,000 and change were labeled problematic. Now, the, the sad truth is that all 24,000 ended up being added to our roles. Because when push came to shove, um, there was just 
you know, too much, too much heat. And the uh, person who was in charge of our roles felt like it would just be safer to just put them all on rather than stand their ground because they were still involved in a lawsuit that had been filed by this same group in 2008 when, and I'm not getting these numbers wrong, so listen to what I'm telling you, and, and it is truly the amazing number that you think I'm saying. In 2008, Houston Votes turned in right at 300,000 applications in the last month before the elections, uh, before the deadline for turning in applications. So many that the process was completely blown you know, into the sky because it was overwhelming the office, right? So the office in Harris County took, took a look at these 300,000 applications and they said, you know what, 70,000 of them are so incomplete, we can't even mail them applications. So they set those to the side. Immediately a lawsuit was filed on those 70,000. Those 70,000 people, even though they couldn't get registrations because they were too incomplete to even be mailed to, those folks were being disenfranchised, according to Houston Votes. And so now, flash forward into 2010, we were having, we were still being impacted by that lawsuit. And just so you know, as we've now come to learn, those lawsuits are not uncommon across the country. That seems to kind of be a play out of the playbook. Now, unfortunately, as I say, they were all added, but what was the real impact? Well, this group was turning in a thousand applications a day. And once we went public with this, those applications dropped from 1,000 a day to fewer than 50. We did have an impact, but it had to, it had to come to being, uh, being spoken of publicly, being talked about in very real terms. The county called a press conference. That press conference happened on a Tuesday. On a Wednesday and a Thursday, the, our groups, Houston Votes and True the Vote, were going back and forth about who said what to whom. Counter press conferences were called, and on that Friday morning, when the counter press conferences were to happen, that Friday morning, all of our election equipment in Harris County was burnt to the ground. 10,000 voting machines, $30 million worth of equipment. Now, I don't know who, why that happened. There has never been any uh, definitive cause for the fire, but I would say this. The statistical probability of having all of that happen in such short order really makes one question. And it's a question that we continue to ask ourselves, frankly, what could we be so close to? What could we be so close to that such extreme measures must be, must be resorted to? So what else do we do in research? Just to give you a little bit of, a, of an idea of, of some of the scale of things that we do now, this is in Wisconsin. T five, five largest counties, five smallest counties in Wisconsin. Um, Milwaukee County. Milwaukee County has 709,854 people eligible to vote, 18 and older. But they have registered 954,008, 100, roughly 120, 126% of the eligible population is registered to vote. National average is about 71. Way to go, Milwaukee County. <laughs> um, in fact, the top five counties all are well in excess of the national average. Smaller counties we did for comparison, you can see are, are more, more in line with the norms. But this is the kind of thing that's kind of, it's happening all over the place, but no one's taking a look at it. Another thing that we found, this is fascinating to us, um, Texas registrations without addresses based on effective date of registration. Now what that means is they, the voter <coughs> registered to vote and gave a mailing address but no physical address. Now you know when you get your voter registration card and it's got all the boxes filled in like what your precinct is and, and you know, who your elected are in the districts in which you live? You can't do that with, with just a mailing address. You, you're actually not supposed to turn in an application with just a mailing address. But yet you see the spikes where this is happening. And, and if anyone wants to uh, give a guess about when that, that big tall line happened, <laughs> the, the, the two tallest ones there, October and November of 2008. In 2008, over 6,000 voters were registered without any address. How, how does that happen? How do we think that that's okay? 
Well, once we recognized that we had um, a problem within our own registry, now we're back into 2010, we developed a training program. We mobilized over 1,000 people in Harris County and countless more across the nation, and we gave all these people what we call incident reports. We asked them, if you see something inside of the polls, please document it, because the first thing you will always be told outside of the polls is, where's your evidence? If you saw something, and you can't bring a recording device inside of the polls, what do you have? What, what can you tell us? Well, in one night, we received and recorded approximately 800 incident reports sworn affidavits. From that then, we took everything that we'd done, everything that we'd done through research, everything that we'd done through working in the polls, and we developed a 22-point legislative agenda. Out of those 22 points, 18 of them became bills, and out of those eight bills, six became law. Now, sad thing is, Texas is what we call a pre-clearance state, meaning that anything that we do as it relates to our elections, first, has to be cleared by the Department of Justice and Mr. Eric Holder. Shockingly, um, those things have not been cleared yet. And so all of the things that we found uh, were successful in having pushed through have not found their, their place into the actual Texas election code. Now, I'm sure first thing Monday morning, you know, now that they've... Uh, now that the Supreme Court's straightening some stuff out for them, I'm sure they're going to have more time on their desks to uh, get to Texas, right? No. Um, but everybody should support election integrity, right? You know, that's been one of, the, one of the great mysteries of this entire effort, is that all the while, all the while that, that we were doing the research, that we were doing the training, we, we were being bombarded bombarded with negative press. We were sued. Uh, somebody put a picture of my house up online uh, with my address and with our business address and with our business financials. And when you went to go look who bought the URL, it was registered to a company on an island off the coast of Portugal. <laughs> you know, at what point did I step through the looking glass on this deal? We just wanted to go work at the polls and now here are the things that we're finding and we're just telling the truth. Why should we get such pushback? Well, in the last just two weeks, two groups have come together, a group called Common Cause and a group called Demos. I know Common Cause is very active here in Colorado. In fact, the, uh, one of the, the players in the Colorado <laughs> Common Cause contributed to this report. Bullies at the ballot box. It was cover to cover a slam of True the Vote. Our little organization that started in Harris County, slam of True the Vote. Rachel Maddow jumped on the bandwagon. That's not surprising. Uh, the ballot cops, this was written in the Atlantic. Um, it was stunning in its inaccuracies. But the thing that really upset me most about this article is, that is such an unflattering picture of me. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's and then this was the front page of the New York Times. Um, if, you, if anybody caught this, or if you have, a, you know, have interest to go back home and Google it, you will see that the whole, the whole uh, thread of the story was woven around a comparison of our efforts to Harry Potter. Because in, in my talk, when, when I was speaking there, I was in Ohio, and I talked about what we'd seen in Wisconsin with buses coming and delivering voters. Well, all we can say is what we saw the, the effects of inside of the polls. We're not in a position to be outside taking pictures of buses. And I explained this to the New York Times reporter. I gave them audio tapes of when people were calling in on the radio about this. I gave video accounts of when people said they'd seen the buses, but I didn't have the picture of the bus. That propelled a whole new line of mockery about what, certainly that there, there could be no vote fraud because in Harry Potter world, it's just a magical bus. Um, it has been out of control, and the question is why? Ladies and gentlemen, we, we need help in the polls. We have reached a place in this country where what the people want and what our government tells us that they want don't match up. Um, the, the, the vast majority of Americans, 74%, want photo voter identification. But yet, our administration says, 
photo voter identification is bad, and we will, and they have, they have sued literally every state that has tried to push past legislation, except for New Hampshire. And New Hampshire is kind of an interesting story because New Hampshire, even though it was required to pre-clear everything, New Hampshire hasn't played by any federal rules in generations, and so it was very easy for the Department of Justice to kind of slide that one through. But in all fairness, they didn't sue New Hampshire, they sued everyone else. Uh, they are also suing states that do not have, in their opinion, enough um, voter registration offices set up inside of social services uh, offices. That's, um, it's part of the National Voter Registration Act. Again, there's, there's no problem with that, but the counterpart to that was that we also needed to keep the rolls clean. And any state that tries to clean their rolls up, the Department of Justice is also very quick to jump in and, and sue them and stop them from cleaning their rolls. It is a bizarre time in the life of our country. And what we need more than anything right now is for people who will go and work in the polls. We need poll workers, we need poll watchers, and that is necessary here in Colorado. Y'all have a great setup here in the state, or not a setup necessarily, you have a great opportunity here in the state because you don't have to only work in the counties in which you live. You can go to other places. And there are other places, Denver County, Pueblo County, that need help, that do not have enough people working there. Uh, so if, the, if, you're, if you're thinking now, great, this is all well and fine, but how would you actually get involved? True the Vote has developed uh, an online program where you can go, you can sign up, and I'm going to run through this very quick, quickly. You can sign up, you can log in, you'll be connected with your team, you'll be able to engage in all kinds of discussions about election integrity and what's happening across the country. And we also offer training online so that, and this is state-specific training. So, in fact, this, this, is the, this is the Colorado ebook that you can print out. It's got all your state-specific information, everything you'd ever want to know about how to be a poll watcher in Colorado, how to get involved, how to get plugged in, and there is an already a, a state effort um, underway called Colorado Voter Protection that you can be a part of. But this is something that, um, ladies and gentlemen, I, I just I believe, I believe it to the marrow of my bones. This is this is a year that we. We can't sit out. Voting is not enough this year. No matter what side of the political spectrum you find yourself on, we need to be engaged at the polls. To find ourselves sitting at home watching the, watching the returns roll in while the polls are still open in your community and people are furiously trying to count the votes and wrap things up and make sure it's all done properly, those folks need help. And if you're worried about where we're headed as a country, it all starts inside of the polls. We've got to make sure, we've got to make sure that we know that we know that we know that our elections are being free, are being conducted in a way that is free and fair. And the only way that works is when citizens get engaged. And the last thing I'll leave you with here and then we'll get to turn it over to questions, but um, 0.0092%. You, you hear, I mean, I'm sure you've heard it a lot lately, uh, both camps saying that this election is going to be tight, 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 maybe separated by just a few hundred votes. Well, in 2000, our presidency was decided by 0.0092% of the electorate. This year has all the makings of a Florida 2000. And if you recall how we all felt when we came home and watched the television and saw the guys holding the chad, you know, the hanging chads up to the light and trying to figure out if it was hanging to the left or the right and what that meant, that put our, our country um, in a state of paralysis that took us years, years, years to recover from. We do not want to find ourselves there again. And the best way we can safeguard against that is by having engaged, trained, honest, committed volunteers inside of the polls. So, in closing, two steps. Step one is if you're interested in finding out more about True the Vote, you can sign up to volunteer at truethevote.org. And step two, just start. 
I've thrown a lot of data at you. I've, I've covered a wide berth of things that, that are involved with election integrity. Don't get overwhelmed by it. Tonight, the message really is very simple. We've developed a comprehensive program that now is actually active in 35 states. We have hundreds of groups working all across the country to see that this happens in their own states. But just take a step at the time. If, if something that I've said tonight to you uh, sparks on some level, please check it out. And if, in fact, what I've said to you tonight doesn't spark, that's okay too. Um, everyone has something they can do. You know, in Texas, uh, we have a saying, we're, gonna, we're fixing to do something. I'm fixing to go do this. I'm fixing, I'm fixing to go work at the polls. This year, let's not fix them to do it. This year, let's do it. Because it truly is, it truly is up to us. And we can no longer watch on the sidelines and be spectators of our own government. Because we, in fact, are the government. And it begins and ends with us. And so, think about this. If our elections are not truly fair, we are not truly free, and that's where it boils down. It's, a, it's, a, um, it's an exciting time that we're living in. We're living in historic days, and you've all been chosen to play an important part of that. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't introduce uh, our, the newest part of our team, uh, Adriana Boyne, who is going, if you wouldn't mind, just take a couple minutes, and, and Adriana is um, helping us reach out to, to communities where we might not have otherwise had a voice uh, and oftentimes aren't being well represented in the national discussion either. So Adriana, why don't you tell people what you're doing with this? I'm so excited to be here in Colorado with all of you. One of the things that uh, is important is that uh, through the vote and other people who believe in integrity and transparency have been accused that um, they want to disfranchise minorities. And that is a complete lie. But we have heard that even from the mouth of our attorney general who came to Texas to tell us how to run Texas. But certainly <laughs> he came to the LBJ library and um, totally said that uh, people who want photo ID, because we passed photo ID in Texas, that it was because we didn't want the minorities to be part of elections. Interestingly, to go and listen to him in the library, you have to show your photo ID before you came in. <laughs> so that was kind of ironic. But the important thing is that the Latino community, there are so many of us, which uh, some of us, 27% uh, of the Latino vote in the United States are Americans like me, which is Americans by naturalization. To be an American by naturalization, <laughs> thanks. To be an American by naturalization is not a second class citizen. As a matter of fact, sometimes some people who have run up on me because I do have an accent and actually you cannot be president of the United States, so you are a different kind of citizen. Well, you know what? I took an oath. I don't know how many of you do, but you know what? This is my country and this is my flag. So to me, I think it's important that the people know that the African-American community, that the Latino community, Asian-American, or any other type of ethnicity, we all believe that integrity and transparency is important. So we, we do know that here in, in Colorado, there is also a high uh, grade of Latinos, and I find my Latina amiga here, <laughs> which I am so glad. Uh, but the truth is this, just uh, in previous elections, which some of the Latinos are not citizens, and let me tell you that more than 11,000 people in Colorado who are not citizens vote, and that's not right. You need to be a citizen to vote. So certainly we're gonna try to go to all the swing sta states and get the Latino community involved also because we all care for America. We all care for transparency. We all care for integrity. That is a value and that's what we are trying to promote. The value of integrity, the value of transparency and the fact that we are preventing cheating on voting. And this is a country for those of us uh, um, who, who, who came here for different reasons, but the only people who can vote are people who are citizens of the United States, and we just can vote once, not twice or more times, right? So I'm so excited to be in the team with the vote, and I, and I really congratulate each one of you for whatever part that you can do, and if you can help uh, through the vote in Colorado. I, I love the fact that you, that you find out that in Colorado, you don't have to live in the county in order to work in other. In Texas, you need to actually be from the county. So you say, well, they don't need me here. I wanna go to another county. It's not that easy, but here, 
it's easier for you if you if you can participate in this. So um, just for you to know, in in the Latino countries, just so you can know facts, Mexico has the safest voting system. And what happened is that they have a photo ID in all the country of Mexico. And you know what? Guatemala has said. Honduras have it, and many other um, Central American uh, countries have photo voter ID. And really, I have never heard a Latino complaining that they want a photo ID. And I have not heard also African Americans, as a matter of fact, some of the people who receive entitlements, you know, do you know that in order to get food stamps, you need to show a photo ID? So why you cannot show if you want to go and vote and in Texas and in other states, you can get one for free. But anyway, I'm so excited to be here and I just uh, look forward to hear more from you and certainly uh, we through the vote, I think that we can, uh, we can make the difference and we can really, uh, as, as Catherine uh, explained, it doesn't matter which party you are, everyone, every candidate deserves a transparent uh, election. I know that there is few candidates here present tonight and I know that they will agree with me. So I appreciate what you do and muchas gracias. <laughs> Okay, well, um, I, you know, it's like drinking from a fire hose. I know that's a lot of information, but any questions about True the Vote or what's happening nationally? Yes, sir. Well, first of all, thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, the photo ID question, has it reached the Supreme Court? Yes, it actually has, and it's been, it's been judged constitutional on two separate occasions in Georgia and in Indiana. Um, Unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be enough now. Um, now the Department of Justice is still stepping in to sue to stop photo voter identification. And the only way a state can push back is to get it to the Supreme Court. That's what Texas is doing. That's where South Carolina is right now, is waiting to hear final arguments. Um, it's being from Texas and seeing what's, what's happened, um, the way we've had to defend something that is, n that is already designated, already acknowledged as being constitutional. And the irony is Texas legislation was modeled after Georgia's. And here's something else, a little known fact. In Georgia and Indiana, once photo voter identification was in place, minority turnout actually went up dramatically and has continued to go up. Why is that? I submit that it's because people feel like their vote really has value. You know, everybody should have the opportunity, should have the right to vote. If you're a legal registered citizen and you meet the qualifications, you should have the right to vote. But with that right comes responsibilities. And if you if you come and you know that your photo voter identification is being used to make sure that the process is being conducted with integrity, people, people want to be a part of that. So long answer to a short question, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, an, it's, you know, I've been doing this now for three years and I've been called an awful lot of things and if you go home tonight and Google, you know, don't have the children in the room because it's pretty tough stuff, some of the things that have been said about me. It still breaks my heart to think about what could be behind such a coordinated effort to try and stop the transparency of this process. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Citizens. And, I thought, and, and they said, see, uh, you know, it's just all, uh, they were proving right. the point that 